I mean, writing is like jogging. I hate jogging, but I love how I feel afterwards. Lebanon was fighting for its independence, but I was fighting for mine. We don't forget where we came from, and we don't forget how hard it is, you know, what we have, and we try to keep. Major funding for Arab American Stories was provided by Mohammed and Jamie El Arian, the Arab American Community of Michigan, the Arab American Community of Houston, Texas, the American Syrian Arab Cultural Association of Michigan. Additional funding was provided by Art and life are an arabesque in these three stories. Author Alicia Arian mines her life's experience and melds it with her own imagination. International artist Hujette Kaland has found America to be where she can most freely express herself artistically. Hassan Faraj's life was actually turned into art. The story of this beloved neighborhood butcher became the subject of a community theater piece. Alicia Arian is a writer born to a Polish mother and an Egyptian father. Her critically acclaimed novel, Towelhead, is a semi-autobiographical coming-of-age story. Alicia candidly admits that one of her strengths as a writer is that she's never afraid to embarrass herself for a good story. I was a very poor student most of my life. And in fact, it, it seems to be because I had um, a, a heavy-duty case of undiagnosed ADD. Um, so I was diagnosed in adulthood and now I take drugs and my life is different and better. And, um, and I can say that on camera because it's in my book, so everyone's going to know anyway. I mean, writing is like jogging. I hate jogging, but I love how I feel afterwards. I decided to become a writer when I was in college at SUNY Binghamton. So I looked at the course offerings that they had listed on the wall and I just thought, I can't do any of this. There is no way in hell. I mean, I had to go to community college to get my grades up so I could even get into, you know, SUNY Binghamton. It was a disaster. And then I saw like Creative Writing 101 and I thought, I could probably do that. I could probably like, you know, score an A because I could write. So then I started, you know, taking the classes and I actually realized I wasn't that great, but I had two things that I was willing to do, which was embarrass myself and expose myself hugely, which I'm still doing. And then also I wrote longer things than anyone. was in uh, seventh grade, I think it was, my mother, or the summer before seventh grade, my mother sent um, my brother and me to live with our father, who was Egyptian, in Houston, uh, where he was working. My parents were obviously divorced. And, um, and it really, um, we were there for about seven months. It did not go well. Uh, my father is a very smart and funny man, but he's also... Um, very difficult, and, um, and he wasn't the greatest father. Daddy met me at the airport in Houston. He was tall and clean-shaven and combed his wavy, thinning hair to one side. Ever since my mother had ground up his glasses, he'd started wearing contacts. He shook my hand, which he'd never done before. I said, aren't you going to hug me? And he said, this is how we do it in my country. Then he started walking really fast through the airport so I could barely keep up. So Jazeera goes to live with her dad, and she's, um, she's very, very lonely, and she's very desperate to be loved. She has two very self-centered parents, and her father is also abusive and frightening at times, even though he's, at other times, sort of can be warm. He was sitting in his chair with his TV tray in front of him. He had cooked a couple of steaks for us in the broiler and made a salad. My plate was covered with little clumps of gray gristle I couldn't chew into small enough pieces, but there was no gristle on Daddy's plate. 
I couldn't tell if he was a better chewer than I was or if he'd had a better piece of steak. The nice thing about the TV trays was that, with me on the couch and Daddy in his chair, we were too far apart for him to reach over and slap me, which he might have done if we had been sitting at the table. I always thought of my father as weird and different because I didn't like him, because he frightened me. I think that if I had liked him, if he had been not abusive, not frightening, I don't know that I would have thought it's horrible to be, it's horrible to be half Egyptian, which was I think basically what I always thought. And then I met the rest of the people in the family and I was like, wait a minute, I like these people. They're really cool, they're really fun, my uncle in particular. And then he had this conversation with me one time when he was visiting my father. And he said to me, um, oh boy, I don't wanna get weepy. He said, he said, your father made a big mistake with you and your brother. And that was the first time that anybody had ever, you know, anybody like, um, connected to my father, and he had never seen us growing up, but anybody connected to him and said, he messed up. So that experience with my uncle, and, and that lovely thing he said, um, was a big part of starting to feel like maybe it was okay to be um, Egyptian, and, and um, you know, that was, I think he, I think actually my uncle was probably a, bit, a very important part of my being able to change my attitude. I would do readings and typically there would be one or two young women who would come up to me and say, this was the experience I had with my father. And some of them were Arab American girls. Um, my, a colleague of mine at Wellesley who's Korean said, this is my father. Indian women said, this is my father. It, it, it was sort of this universal um, foreign difficult dad book. And, and women seem to, not all women, but many women seem to connect to it in that way. Memoir is narrative and analysis. The, the present of, the, of what, whatever time period you're talking about and then this looking back voice and what does it all mean, this interpretation. The memoir is a book about how I got married when I was 27 to a very nice man who was four years younger than me. And I was really completely immature and also I think had a lot of mental problems. I actually started therapy at a very young age with this fantastic woman named Joy and her whole point was you have got to figure out how to parent yourself. Your parents aren't going to be able to do it for you and then you have to go out in the world and deal with people. And I never really understood what she was talking about until I went to college and I had difficulty getting along with the people that I lived with. And then I go out in the world and I have difficulty having relationships with men. Um, and then I meet this very nice man who I spend several years pushing around and being verbally abusive with. And then my marriage ends and I realize how messed up I was. And I begin slowly, slowly this process of change. And I told my students, I need to, I had, I was divorced in 38. I need to find a man. I need to get a husband. I need to make some babies. And if you girls know of anybody, then you could help me out, maybe. Hold on, baby. Hold on, crazy baby. Yeah, my goodness. And so I did, bizarrely. You know, I told these girls in my class, in my creative writing class, they needed to find me a husband so I could make some babies, and by golly, they did. That's a Wellesley girl for you. You give them an assignment, and they will complete it. <laughs> That's a very good joke. I haven't made that joke yet. Artist Hujette Kaland lives life with passion and beauty. She's the daughter of the first president of Lebanon and made her way from Beirut to Paris, New York, and finally California in pursuit of her artistic vision. But her work shows she has never truly left any one homeland behind. To become myself an artist was the toughest thing to do in Lebanon. Hi. Good morning. 
Good morning. So, uh, two or three things that we could eventually add here a few blacks, and here I would like to add one or two. Not much. It was very difficult to establish myself as an artist in Lebanon when they knew that I was the daughter of my father, the wife of my husband, the sister of my brothers, the mother of my children. Everything was impossible to deal with. As soon as I had the freedom of moving, I came to America because I always wanted to come to America because I thought that the artistic expression at that time, what I knew of it, seemed to be freer here than anywhere else in the world. This is a nice piece, it's very ambiguous. Mm -hmm. What's the next step for this piece? Nothing on this, but something on that, like that this will be spitted from here. You mean like another shade of gray? No, not really. We'll decide. Well, I'm just wondering whether this is paint or just the markers. I don't find it. And these are pretty well done, huh? Mm -hmm. You should stop me from touching. I know, that's why I hung them really high. <laughs> I know you hung them up. When do we have to send them? Monday. But I, what I would like is to have new pieces. You have the great one over there too, if you want to yeah. give us a drawing to fill in. I never thought I would have a crew like that. They are nice, they are young. They make me feel young with them. It means I have their eye, which is much better than all the rotten eyes of my generation. I'm born Lebanese, I became French by marriage, and American by choice. I think it's extremely interesting and enriching to have grown up in uh, another part of the world. Beirut was a lovely city, lovely. It was charming. It was absolutely charming. The colors were sharp, they, were, they looked like candies. The history of the Middle East was made, shaped, while I was growing. My mother was the youngest daughter of a family of bankers. And my father was a Maronite from the mountains. He became the president of the Republic. It wasn't easy, but he had a journey. It was a very political climate. And when I had a birthday party one day and all the table was set for all the kids, seven of them didn't come and their parents never called to say sorry because they were French and they were protesting the fact that my father was fighting for the independence. So these are the memories of my childhood that were quite painful. And you still are friends with them, and I married French. Lebanon was fighting for its independence, but I was fighting for my mind. My parents, do you think they appreciated that I was marrying the son of their political enemy. We were all coming from the same bourgeoisie, but his family was pro-French mandate, and my family was pro-Lebanese independence. I never stopped loving my parents, but I wanted to be my own self since I was 13. We are still married. He lives in Lebanon. I live here, we are good friends.
I didn't leave for my hour because you can do art wherever you are. I left because I wanted a career. I thought that I was strong enough to confront the world with my work. I thought I had wings to fly. And I said goodbye to everybody. For 80 years old, my hands are remarkably good servants. I'm, I'm getting better with age. Julian and Emily, you can come and take it. There is nothing that I wished for that is not happening. And I think that's incredible. Did you see how much we work? Yeah. Yeah? Hello. Let's go and have lunch while it's, while it's still hot. Albany Park on the north side of Chicago is one of the most diverse neighborhoods in America, boasting that its school children speak 40 different languages. Hassan Faraj runs the Lebanese meat market, a butcher shop started by his father. He prides himself on his knowledgeable service to his regular customers. In fact, Faraj is so embedded in the community that art imitated life when he inspired a piece in the Albany Park Theater Company's production, Feast. It's a family business. My father was a butcher, grandfather was a butcher. I have to stress to people how important it is that this man has such pride for his job. I have to stress to people how well he does it. My dad taught me, you learn with your eyes. I followed how he moved the knife. How he cut the meat. It's not how strong you are, how big you are. It's how you concentrate. My dad's been a butcher all of his life. Since he was uh, 12 years old in Lebanon. I'm very happy, very proud of you know, what we have accomplished. You know, considering that when we came to this country, you know, I mean, it's not like we came poor, but like I said, it was very hard. People don't realize how hard it was. Actually, we didn't want to leave. You know, we had a good life. My dad had an awesome life. You know, we used to, from school uh, on the weekends, we could go to the ocean, you know, buy something, walk on the ocean, and enjoy life. But then the war happened, and we couldn't do that no more. So we had to leave. <laughs> we had it so good in Lebanon. No matter how much we make over here, it's not as much as back home. The reason my family came to this country is the Civil War in Lebanon. When we walked through the airport, they had guys with machine guns. I mean, you're talking, I came, I was 10 years old. So, it was just another thing, you know, nothing major. But then we went back in uh, 1980, we went back to Lebanon. Because they told us the war was over. Which wasn't, <laughs> it was just the beginning. And we were there for almost uh, 11 months before we came back. And this summer, for the first time in 29 years, I visited Lebanon. Every nationality you can think of, we have in this city, in this neighborhood. I got Filipinos, I got Korean, Mexican, Puerto Ricans, you know, Indian, Pakistani, Palestinians, Lebanese, Jordanian, Syrians. Even from Saudi Arabia, I got customers. With him being in Albany Park, you know, so many different cultures come to him for meat. 
you know, and so many different cultures want to meet in different ways, you know, and he shows that he, he respects that, you know, he explains how, you know, he loves, he loves to serve Mexicans because, you know, for them it's, it's just easy, you know, they just come for barbacoa, he can leave the bone in. Whatever the customer wants, we cut it for them. I have Arabs, Mexicans, Indians, Pakistanis, Filipinos, everybody's different. The easiest customers are Mexican. They come for barbacoa. I can leave the bone in. No trouble. Arabs want to meet one way, so just uh, all the way for kids. Well, Mexicans, they love to cut their meat big pieces. Indian and Pakistani, they love to cut very small pieces. They cut it with the bone, and they like the flavor of the bone and the meat together. Uh, Palestinians, they like to cut it like some medium pieces, the big pieces and they love to cook a lot of meat with the bone. They don't like to debone the meat. Uh, Filipinos, they love the small pieces too. They love to cook with the bone. The hardest customers, Indian and Pakistani. Not as people. They ask for very small pieces. They keep saying smaller and smaller. <laughs> a, a lot of um, Indians and you know, Pakistanis in our audience, they start laughing at that, that line when I say it. They start laughing because they know exactly what I'm talking about. They know exactly that how how their culture loves the meat, and they find it funny that it's that it's a little bit of a, a nuisance to this man, but he does it. Eleven is me, man. Alaykum salam. I was ready to go to the Marines in '84. I finished high school, but my dad uh, changed my mind. He said not to go. So my cousin went instead. Now he retired from the Marines. And now he's a lawyer. And now when you see my brothers and I tell them, you have this opportunity, you know, like grab it and work at it and take it. Sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't, but it's up to them. I mean, they working hard in school and educate, you know, and they want to do better, which I'm happy for them because they have the opportunity that we didn't have, you know. But I believe, you know, with the hard work that we put together, we, it was just a good uh, life. At the time we came into this business, we had no choice. 25 years later, my little brothers have a choice. They both go to college. My daughter will go to college. And my father, I told my father, after 60 years, it's time for you to stay home and enjoy your life. The kid that was presenting the piece, you know, I think he studied it well and I think he probably took it to heart, you know, what I told him. But thank God for everything. Alhamdulillah, you know, we survived. And, we, and that's why we don't forget where we came from. And we don't forget how hard it is, you know, what we have and we try to keep, you know. And that's why we try to insert to the, my brothers or, whoever, or to my children or to the students that came to me and they wanted to learn, you know, how we opened here and what we did, you know. And we try to explain to them, you know, and if they listen, more power to them. I'm Layla Alami and I'm uh, a writer. I think in fiction, the biggest mandate really is you have to tell a story and a story has to be about the individual, about the character. It can't, I think it's better to leave messages to to the postman, right? It is enough to tell the story of a character and that in itself might teach the reader something about the human condition or something about the world and that is enough. The only effective way to counter whatever images exist about people like you um, in the media is to create your own images. There is no other way. So, I mean, as a writer, I write the kinds of stories that interest me, the kind of stories that feature characters that interest me. And oftentimes those characters end up being people who are also Moroccan. And, and, and um, so I think that that's the only answer is to create your own stories and not wait for somebody else to write stories about you. 
I am Netta Ulavi. Hope to see you next week for more Arab American stories. Major funding for Arab American stories was provided by Mohammed and Jamie El Arian, the Arab American Community of Michigan, the Arab American Community of Houston, Texas, the American Syrian Arab Cultural Association of Michigan. Additional funding was provided by 